Hi, in this video, we're going to be looking at the pancreas and the adrenal glands. So with um, the previous lesson, we are going to be um, focusing in on the learning objectives, that is to say, identifying the endocrine organs, the hormones they produce, their target cells, and these the effects they have on those cells. There is a big list of keywords associated with this section. Um, please don't feel overwhelmed by it. Remember that a lot of these are anatomical words that you do know. The ones that you don't know, they're quite straightforward and easy to figure out, and we'll go through them um, throughout this lesson. First thing we want to look at is the pancreas. Pancreas is this leaf-shaped organ found um, in the body as part of the digestive system. So it's an exocrine organ and it's also an endocrine organ, which means that it secretes hormones. Um, we know from year 11 that the pancreas secretes pancreatic enzymes. But um, in year 12, we're going to focus on the hormones. Within the pancreas itself, it has um, a collection of cells called the islets of Langerhans. And here you can see the dark purple ones are the beta cells within the islets of Langerhans. And these secrete the hormone insulin. Now we know that insulin will stimulate cells to take up glucose, thus removing it from the body. The other type of cells found in the islets of Langerhans are alpha cells. Now alpha cells are antagonistic to beta cells. So that is to say that these produce hormones that have the opposite effect. So alpha cells will secrete a hormone known as glucagon and this will stimulate glucose to re-enter the bloodstream and raise that blood glucose concentration. Here is um, a basic graph just to indicate how insulin works. So if we look at the x-axis here, we can see the three times where this individual has consumed a meal. And the y-axis is showing the blood glucose concentration. The blue line is showing the insulin response. So remember, insulin stimulates removal of glucose from the bloodstream. And the red line is showing the glucose um, levels at that particular time. So what we can see is there's a lag, very slight lag. So once the blood glucose concentration rises, the level of insulin becomes elevated also and that acts to bring down that blood glucose level. And it does that in every single peak on that graph. Now you should also note that these um, blood glucose levels, that's the red line, never goes completely back to zero. That would be a really bad situation, um, but it maintains it within tolerance limits. So we're, we're looking at homeostasis again. So just a reminder of how these hormones, glucagon and insulin, are antagonistic to each other. We can look at this um, simple flow diagram. If we have uh, um, an increase in blood glucose concentration, then we are uh, our pancreas is the alpha cells and uh, sorry the beta cells in particular are stimulated to secrete insulin. Insulin will stimulate glucose to move into body cells, um, and this will lower that blood glucose concentration. If that level of glucose gets too low, for example, if you are fasting or you haven't eaten in a long time, for example, when you wake up in the morning, you've had a period of fast, your glucose levels never drop to zero because the hormone glucagon produced by the alpha cells in the islets of Langerhans will stimulate that stored glucose to be released and thus it will raise your blood glucose again. So these two hormones are um, antagonistic to each other. They're working in opposition. 
Now, there's more to the story than just simply glucose going into cells and glucose coming out of cells. This is where some of those um, words in your key list um, will come in. Any um, extra energy that we take into our body, so for example, extra calories that we consume that we are not using straight away, we store them um, initially as glycogen. So this is a large storage molecule made up of glucose molecules joined together in a branching fashion. Now, if our glycogen stores are full, we then store excess as fat in adipose tissue. So these two storage facilities help us to retrieve energy when we need it. One thing that we need to mention here is the liver is a massive source of um, carbohydrate store. So the liver can store up to about 100 grams of glycogen. So that's a lot of glucose. And we are constantly um, storing glucose after a meal and retrieving it during periods of fast. If you are unable to do that, then that may um, suggest that you are suffering from a condition such as diabetes mellitus. So this would be type 1 diabetes, and we'll discuss that in the next lesson. This diagram here is just another uh, graphic to help you understand how um, glucose, glycogen, and fat and the liver are all interacting with each other to maintain a normal blood glucose level. Please take the time to look at this diagram and make sure that you understand it. If you have any questions, um, please get back to me. All right, so the functions of insulin. You should all know from earlier um, in, in your science education that insulin um, chiefly um, stimulates the uptake of glucose by skeletal muscle cells and fat cells. But what it also does is promotes the formation of glycogen from smaller glucose molecules. And that um, formation of glucose to glycogen is called glycogenesis. So the prefix glyco is for glycogen and genesis means to create. So it's glycogen creation. So that's the first keyword. When we have filled our glycogen stores, um, the excess energy is uh, converted into um, adipose, um, is, is stored in adipose tissue. And the, this um, lipid being stored in our fat cells is known as lipogenesis. So lipo for fat, genesis to create. So we're creating fat. Now these processes, all three of them, they will all act to lower blood glucose levels and they are all under direction of the hormone insulin. All right, if we look at the antagonist of that, that's glucagon. If we um, want to lower blood glucose levels, there's two things that can happen. Obviously, we'd stop secreting so much insulin, but we would be increasing the production of glucagon from the alpha cells in the pancreas. Now, glucagon will stimulate the conversion of glycogen to glucose. So we're splitting up glycogen. So to split up something means lysis, and we are splitting up glycogen. So glycogenolysis is pronounced glycogenolysis. Okay, so we are breaking up that large glucose molecule, probably stored in the liver and skeletal muscle, and breaking it down to glucose. So these molecules are now small enough to get out of those cells and enter the bloodstream. Similarly, um, fatty acids and amino acids are converted to glucose. So if we are running out of glycogen, we can then turn to these two forms of energy store. Um, and this would be lipolysis. So lipo, again, referring to fat and lysis to break down. So we're breaking down fats, lipolysis. 
There are other hormones that are involved with increasing blood glucose concentration. Um, and sometimes these can flood the body with glucose very quickly. So that would be referring to adrenaline. And other times it happens more progressively. So that is the hormone called cortisol and also growth hormone, since growth hormone requires um, a respiratory substrate for protein synthesis. There is a division of the nervous system known as the sympathetic division of the nervous system, which will also stimulate um, glycogenolysis. Now, we don't need to really worry about that just now. We'll talk about that more when we look at the nervous system, but just be aware that there, when we want rapid conversion of glycogen to glucose, we would look towards the nervous system response, seeing as that's faster. This is just a um, pictorial summary of that entire process. Um, if you want to take the time to pause the video and look at that, this might be helpful if you're more of a visual learner. Okay, so now we talked about the pancreas and the two hormones that it secretes to regulate blood glucose. We're now going to look at the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are situated on top of the kidney. So this is one here and the kidneys are towards the posterior of the abdomen. If we look at this um, cross section of the adrenal gland, we can see that it has a capsule. So that's the coating on the outside. It has a cortex and the middle portion is known as the medulla. Now, when we talk about the medulla, it's important that you refer to it as the adrenal medulla because there is another medulla in the body um, and we'll talk about that in the nervous system. So you must make sure that you are letting your marker know that you are aware which medulla you're referring to. So we can um, subdivide the adrenal gland into the cortex and the adrenal medulla. Now the outer cortex um, is made up of glandular tissue, whereas the adrenal medulla is made up of neuronal or neural tissue. So here um, I have given you a um, easy summary of which hormones are produced where. So the adrenal gland, the outside or the crust, the cortex, so this is the outer crust. This produces two hormones that you need to know about. The first one is cortisol. Now cortisol, we're gonna talk about more in a second. It's a low level stress hormone. So how we produce cortisol, you'll remember from your lessons um, a few days ago, is that the anterior pituitary gland will secrete a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH. This ACTH specifically targets the adrenal cortex and the adrenal cortex will produce the hormone cortisol. Cortisol has an effect on the body by targeting the liver and stimulating the liver to break down that glycogen, that stored glucose, um, in a slow way. So cortisol targets the liver to enable glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose to produce, sorry, the breakdown of glycogen to produce glucose. The other function of the adrenal cortex is to secrete a, a hormone called aldosterone. You may have heard of aldosterone before. It's a hormone that targets the kidneys and it helps to maintain blood pressure in the body through um, ensuring that we retain salts, sodium and potassium. So the more salt you have in your bloodstream, the higher your blood pressure is going to be. So the level of aldosterone is carefully controlled to make sure that you have just the right amount to maintain good blood pressure. All right, so if we look to the inside of the adrenal gland, so that's the middle, that's the adrenal medulla, that secretes two hormones, adrenaline 
and a derivative of adrenaline called noradrenaline. So these are separate hormones. These um, are involved in the fast response for glycogenolysis. So you would be using these two hormones in your fight or flight response. If something is um, causing you imminent danger or you are very apprehensive something, you may feel a flood of energy in your body. This is um, a direct cause of adrenaline, which is the rapid breakdown of glycogen to produce glucose as a respiratory substrate. Okay, so um, you'll see in your textbook that aldosterone um, is referred to as a mineral corticoid. Um, you just need to understand that aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex, which is the outer portion of the adrenal gland. And its job is to regulate the salt levels in the blood and hence uh, regulate blood pressure. So the target for aldosterone are the kidneys. We also have another group of hormones known as glucocorticoids, and we're just going to function on, uh, sorry, focus on cortisol. Now, cortisol is produced by the adrenal cortex, so this is the crust on the outside of the adrenal gland. It helps to maintain metabolism and it helps us to increase resistance to stress, and we're talking about long-term stress here. Cortisol is only secreted from the adrenal cortex in response to ACTH from the anterior pituitary gland. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the adrenal medulla in a little bit more detail and focusing on that fight or flight response. So um, as the picture is kind of trying to show um, a situation where let's say a raging bull is running towards you, you're definitely going to be jumping higher and um, fast and, and running away faster than you would um, normally under extreme stress and a very quick reaction. So like I said before, we have two similar hormones, adrenaline and noradrenaline, sometimes referred to as epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the American pronunciations. You can use whichever ones you want. And like I said, these deal with short-term stress and rapidly flood the body with glucose through the breakdown of glycogen, which is glycogenolysis. Okay, so short-term stress we know is known as the fight or flight syndrome or fight or flight response. Um, in today's world, we generally don't associate this with running away from wild animals. Um, it can be um, when we perceive danger in our lives or if we're competing at a high level in an event or if we are required to perform at a high level such as in an exam. Changes to our body that you will need to know about, and again, we will revisit this in the nervous system topic, is an increase in heart rate. So that makes sense because you want to pump that blood around the body at a much faster rate to get that glucose to where it needs to be. You will have an increase in blood pressure to force that blood faster. We're going to convert glucose, sorry, glycogen to glucose at a faster rate. Um, and we are going to divert blood away from the gut and the kidney because they are not really needing that much blood at this time. You really want that blood to be going to your brain and to your skeletal muscles. Um, adrenaline will also increase your metabolic rate in, in your cells to ensure that whatever you're trying to do, you can do it quickly. All right, so now we're going to be looking at long-term response. Hopefully you'll be associating long-term stress response with the hormone cortisol. Um, living in a state of um, constant low-level stress is not considered normal, and it's important that you look to ways to manage this um, because your, your body um, is not equipped to deal with really prolonged levels of stress. Um, in a normal response to longer term stress, 
um, you're, you will work to conserve energy, for example, during periods of starvation, and you will look to um, resist any physiological changes in response to that stress. Um, if that stress continues, then you will experience exhaustion and fatigue, um, and you may even start to find that you're um, getting ill or picking up little bugs more often, and that's because your immune system is starting to fail and you're no longer able to fight disease the way you were. Physiological changes to long-term um, long stress include um, proteins and fats being converted um, to glucose so that you have a constant energy level in your body, so constant glucose supplying your bloodstream. You would have suppression of the immune system because you're diverting your energy to what your body perceives as an immediate or long-term threat. Okay, so this um, graphic is in your booklet, and I'd like you to take the time to read through this carefully um, and understand the differences between a prolonged stress response, um, and this is um, driven through hormones, and a short-term, more rapid stress response, which is driven by nerve impulses. It's important that you are able to make the distinction between the two and know that the short-term response um, is to do with adrenaline and the adrenal medulla, whereas the longer-term response is associated with cortisol and the adrenal cortex, which is the outer portion of the adrenal gland. Um, this is just another cartoon for more of a visual. If you feel that this is going to help you, um, I would suggest maybe printing this out and annotating it if you're more of a visual picture person, if you feel that's going to help you learn. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the different hormones produced by endocrine glands. These are the ones that we have covered um, so far. And these are hormones that are produced by endocrine organs, not in the pituitary gland. So please make sure you're filling out your booklet and that you are familiar with these and you understand how um, these glands hormones work and the effects they have and where they have their effects. Okay, now that we've um, talked through this, um, your uh, task is to complete pages 20 to 26 of your class booklet. Please use your textbook to help you um, and any other sources that are available to you.